Okay, welcome to the beginning of AP Chemistry. Uh, we're glad you're here. These videos are going to be designed to help you if you miss class, if, um, if you just wanted to go back and review some of the class notes. Um, we're only going to go through the practice problems that we do during class, not necessarily the notes themselves. So these might be a good supplemental, but they're never really meant to uh, take the place of the traditional notes that we're going to be going through in class. But if you want help with the practice problems, uh, these are here for you. Um, so the first one we get to once we talk about the metrics is putting the following in order from smallest to largest. Um, so we need to define each of these guys. And we want to have these memorized. So if we go through these, um, I'm going to do scientific notation. Uh, you can do lots of different ways. Um, centi is going to be 10 to the negative second. Mega is 10 to the sixth. That's a million times bigger. Centi is 100 times smaller. Uh, milli is 10 to the negative third. Deca is 10 times bigger. Deci is the smaller one, 10 to the negative one. Nano, 10 to the negative ninth. That's about as far as we go. That's kind of the scale of atoms and molecules. Um, kilo is a thousand times bigger, so 10 to the third. And micro is 10 to the negative sixth. So rearranging those guys to put them in order, we get nano is first. That's the smallest one. Uh, micro, milli. And then so on and so on and so on. Um, centi, deci. These are kind of the main ones too. Uh, there are some other ones that we don't need to know, but we're going to deal with a lot of these. Especially on the smaller side. Um, and then don't forget you need to know how to convert between these. We need uh, prefixes as well as... Um, the symbols. So micro is kind of always the obscure symbol there. It's like that um, Greek letter mu. Uh, but all the other ones, nano is an n, milli is a little m, c, uh, d, I think it's dk, and then a capital M for mega. Oh, I messed up here. This one's actually going to be da, I think, for deca. And here we have uh, some information that goes with the next slide as well about accuracy versus precision in a lab setting. Um, the important part here is that we say, okay, the true mass of this textbook, we've got four students weighing a textbook, is 2.31 kilograms. And then we want to identify who is accurate and precise, inaccurate and precise, accurate, imprecise, and inaccurate, imprecise, and just really highlight the definitions or the differences between accuracy and precision in a science context. Uh, the first one we're going to see here is, let's take a look at 2.31 is the real answer, kilograms. Uh, to see who's correct, we're going to look down here at the averages. Each individual trial by itself um, is, isn't going to give us the, the data we want in science. We want repeatability and multiple trials to get an answer. So we're always going to look at the averages here. And real quick, we can see that the 2.31, there were two students that got that Zane. So this one is going to be accurate. And then Michelle as well, accurate. But when you look at their data, their data, they got to their data two totally different ways. Uh, Michelle, we could also say, is precise because all of her data is repeatable. It's almost the exact same answer every single time. Where Zane kind of stumbled upon the answer, this is not a precise, precise work because it's not repeatable. Every answer is different. The average worked out, but um, her methods probably weren't very good. Um, Jennifer, on the other hand, uh, this is not accurate, uh, nor is Brian's. Sorry, guys. But a closer examination shows a, a little story here. Jennifer's work is just pretty much terrible everywhere. It's not even precise. It's all over the board, and it's not even close to the right answer. Um, 
at least Zane stumbled upon his or hers. Um, Brian Zo tells us something here. It's okay to be not accurate if you are precise. That actually tells us something. That tells us that whatever he's doing, he's doing consistently, and whatever error he has is probably fixable. Um, so just highlighting the definitions there between accuracy and precision and the importance to look at the average to determine especially precision. Um, when we get to significant figures, we are um, talking about how much error there is in a measuring device. Um, we always estimate a little bit extra here. So here we have a ruler with uh, 12 uh, markings on it. And we have this object up top, and we want to see what the reading is. Well, we know that the ruler is at least uh, 9, or this marking here, our, our object, rather, is at least 9. We don't really know what the units are. Um, and then it goes a little bit extra. So we want to record that when we're writing down. This object is 9 point something. I'm going to say point... I think it maybe it looks a little bit more than halfway, 9.6. Um, this last number has error in it. If you said 9.5, you'd probably be right. 9.4, that's also correct. There's, there's a lot of variety that we could get to there, but the important point is we all agree that there's one decimal place being recorded. It, it would be not accurate to record another decimal place past that 9.5 or 9.6 or 9.4 um, because we just don't know. This this ruler does not give us that much precision. So our last um, point here, this is a known number, 9, which is definitely 9, but this last number here is an unknown number, and that's going to have uh, implications all year for the math that we have, just recognizing that all numbers have error to them at that last digit that they record. It's a very, very important concept. Um, so draw markings on an instrument to give us the following uh, measurements. So again, continuing with that theme that my last number here is an unknown number. Okay, each one of those has is estimated. So if for number, sorry, for uh, A here, if I had a graduated cylinder, since this is in milliliters, I want it to read 128. Okay. So I'm going to draw markings here at 128, and then I'm going to draw another one at 129. Let me get rid of this here. And my meniscus here would be here, where my device reads 128, and then that 0.7 is estimated up here. 128 point, a guess, 7. This last number has error. Likewise, for the next one, if we had a meniscus here, and we want the 18, that 8, to have the error, the 1 needs to be known, I'm going to mark this one at 10 and 20, and put my meniscus up at the 18 mark. I know for sure that it's 10, and I'm guessing that it's 18. I don't have any other precision other than that, so my last digit is, is a guess. Um, and then, again, with C, this one's going to be a little bit um, more precise. I've got, let's say, 23 down here, and then 24 there. But then I also have the tick marks in the middle. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then the top one is 10. So I have the decimal place actually marked on this one. This one's going to give me 23.45. We're going to put our meniscus in that area to say, okay, it's definitely 23.4 and then a little bit more, 23.45. Um, re reading measuring devices can be tricky, especially if it's a really small device. Writing them um, is also very tricky because you, you don't think of that last one as having error because it cannot be on your device. And then when we get to significant figures, we just need to count the number of significant figures in certain numbers. Which ones are significant, which ones are not. So here we have a whole number, 38.4703. All of these guys are going to be significant. This has six significant digits. 
0.00052. These are placeholders here. My number doesn't actually start until that 52. This has two significant figures. Um, 0 0.05700. The zeros out in front of decimals are placeholders. Those do not count. My 57 counts, but then the zeros at the end also count. They're telling me that those are measured to be zero. Like you can measure something to be right on the line at exactly 0 0.057 measurement, measurement, zero, zero seconds. So those, that one's going to have four significant figures. Um, scientific notation, that should say times 10 raised to the eighth power. Um, Um, scientific notation is such that all the numbers that they give you are significant, so that one's going to have three significant figures. Um, and you can kind of see that, that other example, too. If we put this number in scientific notation, these zeros are going to stay with it. You can see that they're significant. Uh, it would be 5.700 times 10 to the negative second. So scientific notation says, hey, let's get rid of the placeholders. Everything else that we have is still significant. Uh, that's a quick check you can use along the way. A um, little bit of math here. Uh, you can plug these into your calculator. We're putting the sig fig rules is going to be important. With addition and subtraction, our rule is the number of decimal places. So decimal places this has one decimal place, or you could do whole numbers if they're both whole numbers. What place do they have in common? This has one decimal place, so they're going to add up to one decimal place. You need to put those into your calculator and then cut it off after one decimal place. So what we're going to get here, this first one is going to be 9.7. has two significant figures at the end. We're not worried about that at the beginning, but at the end. Um, multiplication says how many sig figs does each number have. The 61 has two sig figs, 0 0.00745. This has three sig figs. My answer is only allowed to have two. So we put that into our calculator. We round it 0.45. And there's no units on any of these. They're just numbers. Um, this has multiplication, division, and it has a subtraction problem over here. So we need to recognize in this subtraction problem that order of operation says, okay, decimal places, two decimals there, two decimals there. When we subtract these, we're going to be left with three sig figs, a number, and then two decimal places. So this whole, unit, this whole term here is going to have three sig figs on the bottom. But over here, 5 times 10 raised to the 16th power. Um, again, it doesn't look like scientific notation transferred over into this program. Well, 5 times 10 to the 16th power, that only has one significant figure. So 1 sig fig divided by 3 sig figs, my answer can only have one significant figure at the end. It's going to be 2 times 10 to the 16th power. Okay. Bear with me here, there's a little bit more scientific notation, times 10 to the 23rd, 10 to the 17th, and then 10 to the negative 11th, 10 to the negative 9th. I think you can see through those. Um, there's addition rules here. Um, pay attention to these, though, because when they're, their magnitudes are totally different, they're not actually lining up in their decimal places. When they're in scientific notation and you're trying to add and subtract, their magnitudes do not align. Put in your calculator 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd plus 4.14 times 10 to the negative 17th. You will get 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. They don't register with one another. The other number is too small. So we still have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. We cannot add the other one. Um, the same thing's going to happen to the other side. It's going to register just off the scale, uh, but it's going to give us 9.1 uh, or negative 9.1 times 10 to the ninth power. Um, and when you put all that into your calculator, we're going to get two sig figs at the end, and it's going to be negative, I think, 5.5 times 10 to the uh, 15th power.